Welcome to Literary Libations with Librarians. And this week, since so many students are going back to school in some way or another, we're going to be talking about books that take us back to school. As we're chatting, the titles of the books and pictures of the covers of the books will appear on your screen. And we'll also be telling you how you could get your hands on these books if you're interested in doing that. For physical copies like hardcovers, paperbacks, CD, audios, large print, you can request those through our online catalog and that website is on your screen right now. Or you could request a digital version using one of the MCLS provided apps. So if you see one listed as OverDrive, that refers to OverDrive or their app, which is called Libby. And OverDrive offers ebooks and downloadable audiobooks. There's also Hoopla, which offers ebooks, downloadable audiobooks, and also movies, music, and graphic novels. And there is also RB Digital, which offers downloadable audiobooks and magazines and week long passes to Acorn TV and the great courses. And the great thing about Hoopla and RB Digital in particular is that there is never a wait for any of the titles that you see on those platforms. And don't forget, if you aren't sure how to get your hands on a title, you are always welcome to call one of your local branches of the Monroe County Library System and speak to a librarian, and we will be more than happy to help you get your hands on one of these titles. With us this week, we've got four staff from the Monroe County Library System. I'm Jennifer Gruneski, and I'm the branch librarian at the Dundee Branch Library. And our introductory question for this week is if you could go back to any grade in school, what grade would you choose? And for me, I would go back to second grade because Miss Holbel was my second grade teacher and I thought she was beautiful and amazing and she did fun things in class. And I particularly remember she was the teacher that read us The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis from the Chronicles of Narnia. And she read that book to us out loud and I loved it. And then she would let us write our own stories and illustrate them. And shockingly, almost every story that I wrote that year, that year featured talking animals. And I remember one in particular where the talking animals were trying to escape out of jail. I don't remember why they were in jail, but I remember that picture drawing my little animals stacked on top of each other trying to get out the barred window. So she just did a lot of fun, creative things. Um, and I just remember loving her. She was, you know, I think you get those teacher crushes when you're little and Miss Holbalt could do no wrong in my eyes. So if I had to go back, I would go back to second grade. Also with us this week, we have a man, Mandy Draganic, who is a cataloger at our Dami administration building. So she makes sure that you can access all of those items in our catalog that you want to be able to request. And which grade would you go back to, Mandy? It looks like I there don't. There we go. So I would go back to my freshman year in college. Um, I loved school, but I did not, not love being told what to do every single minute that I was in school. Um, I also had the best teacher ever. She was my Spanish teacher and my humanities teacher. Um, and she was hilarious. She was smart. She was just fun to be around. And I really learned a lot from her. So that's where I'd go again. Nice. Thank you, Mandy. We also have with us this week, Barbara Kruger, who is the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Monroe County Library System. And if you could go back in time, Barbara, which grade would you go to? I would pick the third grade. And I, I must uh, start with a confession. I thought the question was going to be, who was your favorite teacher? Who happened to be my third grade teacher, Mrs. Hayes? Um, but if I, so if I were answering the question that you really asked, not the one I wanted to answer, I would say third grade. Um, when I was in third grade, I attended a public school. Prior to that, I'd gone to a really tiny parochial school and I loved everything about being in a big classroom with lots of kids. And Mrs. Hayes was probably nearing retirement, as an adult, I can say, she's probably nearing retirement when I was in her third grade class, but she was so patient and so kind. And um, my other favorite teacher was not mine, but my son's teacher, also his third grade teacher. Her name was Mrs. Burns. 
and she was phenomenal with the kids. She uh, had great classroom management skills. She made learning fun. Um, I think teachers have a real gift when they can take valuable education lessons, but make it feel like you're playing a game while you do it. And then when you're done, you're like, oh, I didn't even realize I learned so much. So um, I admire both of those. They're great teachers. Thank you, Barbara. And also with us this week is Jen McCarty, a reference librarian at our Ellis branch. And which grade would you go back to? Oh, tough. I considered a couple of elementary grades, mostly for teachers. Um, coincidentally, my son is in third grade right now. And I mean, of course, the year just started, but so far I'm loving his teacher. So it must be something about third grade. Best um, grade ever. <laughs> but I'm going to go with my senior year in high school for a number of reasons. Senior year is just fine. You've got all the cool, fun stuff. You've, you know, you're the oldest kids. It's, you know, it's cool. Um, but I also had some fabulous teachers and was able to do some really cool things. I was in choir, so um, I was in two different choirs, a show choir and then a concert choir. Little fun facts. Um, <laughs> we went to St. Louis on a choir trip um, and actually competed in some things and we were really good. So that was great. Um, I also had like an independent study one semester with my choir teacher. So I would just like hang out in the choir room and like get credit for it. So it was great. Um, and then I had my AP English class, Mr. Scott McCluskey. Amazing, one of the best teachers I've ever had. So I just had some amazing teachers that year, just, you know, along with just the fun of being a senior and being kind of adultish. Um, yeah, that's I think that's where I would go. I like that word adultish. Adultish. <laughs> Getting closer. I still feel adultish. Yes. That, I, so much, so much. I still feel like, you know, I can't be an adult yet. This, yeah. I can't possibly be doing all those adulty things that I do. Like, this is a grown up job. Is there a more grown up grown up around here? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Where's the real grown up? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. And so now we're going to go ahead and share our back to school or books that take us back to school in some way, shape or form. And I'm going to go ahead and let Barbara get us started with her back to school books. Thank you. So the books I'm going to be speaking about are both by Judy Bloom. It's the Fudge series and we're going to start with Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, um, which is real close to my favorite year, third grade. <laughs> um, it's a classic and it's probably safe to assume that most people have read this book. Uh, but if you haven't, um, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing, or it's uh, about Peter Hatcher. He's nine years old and he's in the fourth grade. And he has a little brother whose name is Farley Drexel Hatcher, but everybody calls him Fudge. And he has a uh, turtle named Dribble that he wanted a birthday party and, and that's his pet. Um, some of the things I really like about the book are that it's written in the first person. And um, I'm sure that was a deliberate choice on the author's part, but I think that makes it really relatable to the reader. So as Peter's talking about his fourth grade experience, young readers can also um, easily identify with that because they're probably having similar experiences, uh, like the trials of being an oldest sibling. Uh, when your little brother messes up your school project that you and your friends have worked really hard on. or Maybe this isn't universal to all fourth graders, but when your little brother eats your pet turtle, because, you know, things, <laughs> things happen. Um, but on the flip side, there's also the the privileges of being the oldest child. Um, you know, you're a role model to your younger sibling and there's that adoration. So in the story, um, a couple of things that have happened that um, they needed the little brother fudge to comply with but he wouldn't. He wouldn't open his mouth for the dentist until Peter came in and modeled that for him. And Fudge wouldn't try on the kind of shoes his mom wanted, wanted him to have until Peter tried on the kind of shoes that Fudge was going to be getting. So it kind of shows the balance. Um, as an oldest child, um, I identify a lot with Peter. Um, I think the uh, classic line from the book that everyone who's read the book is familiar with is eat it or wear it. And um, that happened because like lots of uh, preschoolers, Fudge is a, a finicky eater and he wasn't going to eat what his mom had made for dinner. So for a while he just chose not to eat and then he would only eat if he was being entertained. That meant Peter had to stand on his head. Then he thought he was a dog. He would only eat if they put his plate on the floor under the table. 
and one night his dad had just had enough and he's like you know eat it or wear it and of course uh, fudge would not comply so the dad takes the bowl of cereal and the toddler into the bathroom stands fudge up in the tub and pours the cereal bowl over his head i just <laughs> I find that hilarious. Now, I will tell you, I reread both uh, the books I'm going to talk about today before our discussion because it's been a long time since I've read them. And as a parent, looking back on it, um, I find it hilarious. It, it's clearly, um, you know, it's an older book. It's a classic and times are different now. But, but some of the questioning parenting techniques like leaving your kids unattended in Central Park or pouring a bowl of cereal over your child's head. Um, I'm not saying those are uh, choices I would have made, but <laughs> I found them um, highly entertaining in a book. Um, so there are three uh, primary books in the series. So um, Tales of the Fourth Grade Nothing is the first book. The next book is otherwise known as Sheila the Great. Sheila is a friend of uh, Peter's. But the one I want to speak about is Super Fudge. And uh, at this time, it finds Peter in the fifth grade and Fudge is four years old. And this one I found really interesting, again, from an adult perspective. Um, often in books, authors address significant issues in an easy and relatable way, similar to how good teachers can take um, higher concepts and make them feel like a game in a classroom. I think Judy Bloom does a great job of addressing some of those in Super Fudge, like adjusting to life with a new baby. So the, the Hatcher family um, has a third child, a, a little baby whose name is Tamara Roxanne, but they call her Tootsie. Um, they move to Princeton. The dad takes a sabbatical from work. The mom gets a part time job. It's um, there really are a lot of complex issues in there handled in a, a fun and entertaining way. And I I would highly recommend the series and, and clearly it reminds me of, you know, some fond childhood memories of my own. I love Judy Bloom. Me do too. Me too. I love those books. Me too. One of our panelists said that if I hadn't snatched up those titles first, she was going to take those. <laughs> well, I'll her address that when it's her turn. <laughs> All right. Well, let's have Mandy go next and share her back to school books. Well, I will start with I was that panelist and I totally would have chosen those two books. Uh, they took me right back to the fourth grade where my teacher read them to us. Um, and I did read them aloud to my children later and I found it wonderfully amazing from both sides. Um, but my books are, <clears throat> so the first one's a little bit weird for me. It's called My Lady's Choosing and it's an interactive romance novel. Um, I read it just because I cataloged it actually one day a few years ago and I was instantly back in grade school and I thought you're kidding this is one of those pick your own adventure books and I had to read it just for fun and yes that's exactly what it is it's a romance novel where you choose your own path um you are a penniless but very plucky heroine in the 19th century at the beginning and your very first choice is to accept this job or not. Um, and it just goes on from there. There are several different characters and you're introduced to all of them prior to actually beginning the story. Uh, there is Sir Benedict Granville and Captain Angus McTaggart and all of your choices um, lead you into or out of a relationship with, with these people. It's, I mean, it's not, riveting it's not world changing literature by any means but it was so much fun when i was in fifth or sixth grade like those books were all the rage you could survive volcanoes or climb mount everest or you know and there were always options where you would just die and <laughs> this book is uh, no exception oh oh i was gonna ask that because that was you know part of it you'd read along and you're like oh that wasn't the ending i wanted so then you'd go back and i was like you'd go back and pick the other one yep yeah yep. i um, love those books my son actually has the ones that I had when I was little that my parents bought me for the Choose Your Own Adventure, and he has loved them as well. But I love that they've made them for adults. I didn't even know that that was a, a thing that was happening out in the world. I didn't either. So it was really exciting and just a fun fun read. I think I read it in just a day or two. It was super fast, but um, just so much fun. 
One of the things um, that like discussions is I get great book ideas. I'm going to borrow that book, Mandy. Thank you. And I, I, I'm glad it's available um, digitally. I can probably have it yet, yet this afternoon. <laughs> I bet you can, yes. You know, it's fun. You'll enjoy it. Mm -hmm. uh, so my other book, since I couldn't pick Tales of a Fourth Grade, nothing. Um, I went with the person in a book that I probably felt like I related to the most when I was in school. Um, and that's Alexander. Alexander had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. A lot. Um, and while I didn't have siblings like Alexander did, I felt very, very close to Alexander. Um, and when I had a bad day at school, when, and when I was little, I would often come home and read this book. At one point in time I had, and I love that you picked this picture, Jennifer, because at one point I had this page memorized and I would sometimes come home and while I was getting the book off my shelf, I would say the first page. And I said it just the way it's punctuated. And so I would say, I went to sleep with gum in my mouth and now there's gum in my hair. And when I got out of bed this morning, I tripped on the skateboard and by mistake, my sweater up in the sink while the water was running. And I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. And I would just read the whole book through and, um, I would feel better usually by the time Alexander came to a conclusion at the end. And it's just always been a favorite of mine. And it just takes me right back to, to grade school as an easy way to make a bad day seem better. I do. I love that book, too. And I think all of us have had those terrible, horrible, no good, very bad days in our lives and wish that we, too, could move to Australia. Yeah. But then at the end, his mom tells him, they are terrible, no good, very bad days, even in Australia. Sometimes days are just like that. <laughs> yep, we just got to get through them. I love those illustrations, though, yeah. all of them. And I love the comment, there was kissing on TV. I, don't I like hate kissing. kissing. I, hate kissing yeah. <laughs> I love that. Oh, thank you, Mandy. And now let's have Jen share her back to school books. Okay, so my first book. Um, I'm going to talk about it's called Tangerine. It's by Edward Bloor. And this is one I picked up. I, I want to say this book is like 15 years old or so. I picked it up from like Barnes and Noble or something. I actually bought it. And it was this really rare book for me that I read the whole book, finished it, and immediately started it over. Um, it's like a middle grade kind of reader, maybe young adult, but there's so much packed into this book. That is a book I've read multiple times and it's really stayed with me. It's been several years since I read it and I still really remember a lot of the parts of it where I can't remember things I read last week in other books. So it, this is one that really stuck with me. So um, Tangerine follows Paul, whose family is, he has an older brother named Eric, um, his mom and dad. They've just moved to a new like planned community um, in the suburbs of Tangerine, Florida from Texas. So he's new in town. Um, they're in this, you know, new, just new place. They're in Florida now from Texas. And Paul is a pretty average, like middle school kid, um, loves soccer. Soccer is his passion. But the big difference with Paul is he's nearly blind. He's got some vision, but he wears like super, super thick glasses. And there's a little bit of a mystery surrounding why he's nearly blind. His parents tell him that he that he looked at an eclipse too long when he was little, but he's not really sure that that's what happened. Um, but he loves soccer. Soccer is his big, big thing. So he immediately wants to you know, go out for the middle school soccer team and is pretty much told you can't. You're nearly blind. You're not playing soccer. So he's in um, his family has settled into a fairly affluent suburb of this area and really early into the school year, a sinkhole swallows half the school. So the kids are kind of given the option and it's kind of funny looking back at it now where we're in this weird like virtual, some kids are doing hybrid, some kids are doing, you know, some kids are going to school five days a week, some kids are doing everything online. They're kind of given an option like that where they can go to the school that they're currently at and like split their times like some kids are going later in the day because they only have half the school to work with. Or they could choose to go to Tangerine Middle School, which is in the poorer section of town. 
Well, Paul decides to choose that because he's heard the Tangerine soccer team is super good and he's hoping that maybe there they'll let him play. And they do. And they're really good. And so it, this this book tackles all kinds of stuff because obviously there's socioeconomic stuff. Um, his wealthier school is mostly white, where Tangerine Middle School is heavily Hispanic. A lot of the kids from Tangerine are citrus growers, they're farmers, they're in agriculture, and a lot of them have to help out at home where he doesn't have any of that kind of stuff. And so he meets these new friends who accept him and he gets to play soccer. Meanwhile, there's other weird stuff going on. Um, his mom is kind of social climbing, wants to be super big in the HOA. Um, there's a house in their suburb that continually gets hit by lightning. And if you know anything about, you know, Florida in the summer, like they get storms every day, lightning storms are not uncommon. There's also a, a bunch of thefts happening and like who's involved with that. And then there's er or Paul's brother, Eric, who's just kind of a jerk. <laughs> um, and he's a football star. And even though Paul is actually really, really good at soccer, like his parents kind of ignore that. They're all about Paul and, or Eric and Eric's football. Um, and so there's there's so much packed into this book for like middle readers. There's the socioeconomic stuff of Tangerine versus the wealthy suburb. There's the sibling stuff with Paul, who's the football star, or Eric, sorry, I keep mis mixing up the brothers. Eric, who's the football star and really just an awful character um, and like, and then there's the secret or the, the mystery of what actually happened to Paul's eyes. There's so much packed in here. And I just love this book. Um, it's I I feel like anybody from like seventh grade up can read it and thoroughly enjoy it. So if you haven't even heard of Tangerine or read Tangerine before, it's really, really good. And it's it's a little bit serious, but there's it's good. <laughs> so my second pick, very, very different, a little more fluffy is The Princess Diaries by Meg Cabot. And um, if you only are familiar with The Princess Diaries through the movie, which I love, you don't know The Princess Diaries. Um, the book is really different. So if you're not familiar with the book or just Princess Diaries in general, the main character is Mia Thermopolis. And in the book, um, she lives in New York City. She lives with her mom, who's an artist. Her dad is alive in the movie. Her dad is not. Um, her dad is alive. She knows her family or her dad's family is wealthy and European, but she doesn't know that her dad is actually a crown prince. So her dad comes to her and tells her, hey, remember last year when I had cancer? I can't have any more kids. And that means that uh, you're the only heir to the throne of Genovia. And sorry, I didn't tell you this before, but yeah, you're going to have to move to Genovia with me and be a princess. And she's like, no, that's not going to happen, Dad. I'm not going to uproot my life and be a princess. So they make this deal that she can stay in New York. She'll spend summers in Genovia with her dad and her and the other family. But her grandmother um, from Genovia decides, well, she's got to turn this girl into a princess. So her grandmother comes to America and gives her princess lessons. And if you've watched the movie, you know it's, it's Julie Andrews. And she's harsh, but she's lovely. The grandmother in the books is not a nice character. She's pretty awful. Um, she's no Julie Andrews. But so you have Mia, who's a typical freshman, and she's struggling with, you know, friendships and school, and her mom is starting to date her math teacher, and just, ugh, ugh. And now she's a princess. Ugh. And she's got princess lessons with her grandma. And I just love, <laughs> this book takes me back to school. I mean, I've never went to a Manhattan private school, but I imagine it'd be fun. Um, but you know, you've got not only the school aspect, but you've got the princess lessons and Mia. Mia's just fun and it's told in like journal form. It's Mia writing to her diary. Um, and it's just a very entertaining, very light, very funny, kind of silly, but just endearing, endearing story. And this is another one that I've read multiple times and from, you know, 20 years ago or whatever, when it came out to now, I still love it so much. <laughs> I feel like that one should be a classic now. What does it take to get like classic status? Yeah, I, I feel like it, it really is, is a this just enjoyable story. Even as an adult, it's yeah. it's a good story. It's just fun. Yes, and it, and it teaches you something too. It's got that. Who are you really? 
as yeah. right when you're trying to figure out who you are well, and who like, you want to be and she's getting pulled in so many directions and she's, you know she's kind of a nerd and then of course she gets this makeover and people discover that she's a princess and now all of a sudden she's popular and yeah that's like a crazy thing for anyone to have to deal with but it does kind of make you think like who are my real friends what do i want who do i want to be and who can relate to that more than like high school kids yes and it has a pink cover with sparkles so exactly that wins me Beautiful. over every time <laughs> what more could you ask for that's right very few very few things thank you jen and for my books this week that take me back to school uh, my first one is any of the Ramona books by Beverly Cleary and the covers that I put up here are the vintage covers which would be the actual books that I would have read when I was reading these. These are the covers that I knew and Beverly Cleary is amazing. She talks about how when she started school she didn't like reading at all because the stories didn't interest her. And then she got into third grade and she was handed a book, The Dutch Twins by Lucy Fitch Perkins, which I've never heard of, but now I feel like I need to go out and find it because it was a life-changing book for Beverly Cleary. But she read that book and she loved it because it felt like it was about kids like her. And so she started reading and loving reading. And then she grew up to become a librarian. She was a librarian at um, in Yakima, Washington. And there she starts trying to find books to hand to the kids that are walking into her library. And again, those kids started talking about, well, what they would want to see in a book. And so she wrote one that she thought that they would like. And the very first book that she wrote was Henry Huggins. And then Ramona was a minor character in that book. And then she develops her own series. And there are eight books in the Ramona series. You can read them in any order. It, it doesn't matter. They're all amazing and funny. And these are illustrations from the books that I read when I was in that, you know, that first, second to fourth grade range. And I still love these illustrations. Um, you'll see her pointing to a doll. Ramona named her clearly beautiful and amazing doll Chevrolet because that's a beautiful word Chevrolet Chevrolet and she and her I believe it was her aunt Beatrice owned a Chevrolet and so Ramona named her doll Chevrolet um, and it's clearly a beautiful doll. The next picture shows her what you think is a tricycle but the problem is is Ramona wanted to ride a two-wheeler so they removed a wheel from her tricycle and she would just ride it on two wheels because her parents told her she wasn't big enough for a two-wheeler yet but she's ready and i love the quote there she's not a slow poke grown up she's a girl who could not wait life was so interesting she had to find out what happened next she's got a zest for life and then the picture of her eating the apples was because the first bite of the apple is always the best. So once you've taken that first bite, you don't really need to eat the rest of it. So she went downstairs in their cellar and just took the first bite out of every apple that they had down there. Because of course, why wouldn't you do that? And then I love the picture of her. This, I don't remember exactly what happened, but I know it was at the dinner table and she was being sent away for being out of sorts and probably rude to her family. And her dad sends her away and probably said something like, what happened to my Mary Sunshine? Where did it go? And I just love that face. I am too a Mary Sunshine. And then she gets down from the table and runs away. I just, I just love Ramona. She's exactly what Beverly Cleary set out to create a character that any child can relate to and she makes you laugh and yeah I, I love Beverly Cleary and a classic again for a reason um, and there are things um, Barbara mentioned you know sometimes those books deal with topics and I know in one of them Ramona's dad loses his job and so she's trying, and that's not the focus of the book, but it's definitely going on and it's something that worries her and she knows that her parents are worried. And so it talks about those things that children are dealing with too. 
um, and, but does it in a way that lets you laugh and lets that child know that they are secure, even though things aren't going the way the family might want them to, we are going to stick together and you are OK. So Beverly Cleary, all the all the love and stars and hearts for Beverly Cleary. And then my other title I've read recently and completely different than Beverly Cleary. It is the ninth house, and I'm not going to pronounce the author's name correctly, but I think it's Lee Bardugo. And the ninth house is set at Yale. And it focuses on Alex Stern, who has not made good choices with her life. She has been involved with drugs. She's lived um, and gone through some violence and is, in fact, one of the survivors of a multiple homicide. And while she is in the hospital recovering from this attack, she is approached and said, you know, you're, you're wasting your talents, you're wasting your gifts. We're going to send you to Yale. And in return for that, you need to become a member of what is called Leith, L-E-T-H-E, Leith House. And we'll tell you more about what that involves and what you need to do as a member of Leith House once you get there. But we'll pay your way and make sure that you are well accommodated and you get to attend Yale University. So really, Alex has nothing else going on in her life. So how is she going to turn that down? So she gets there and what she discovers is that Leith House is the ninth house. There are eight secret organizations or secret societies or or houses at Yale. And some of those you've probably heard of, Skull and Bones. Um, there's another one like Scroll and Key. And, and all of these exist in real life, just not in the way they do in the book. Because in the book, they're all, you know, practicing magic and have secret powers. And it is the job of the ninth house, the lathe house, to supervise all of them. And so Alex is being trained by her mentor, Darlington, who is a senior this year at Yale and will be leaving. And so Darlington starts to train her in what she needs to do. And so she has to learn magic and she has to learn different magical ceremonies. And she has to work with all of these people who are very unlike her. I mean, clearly her background isn't what we typically think of as somebody who's attending Yale. So she's dealing with that. She's a college freshman, even though she's 21, so she's older than most of the other people there. So she's very much an outsider learning this new job. And then one night when she's supposed to be supervising some of the magic, things seem to go wrong and someone dies. And so now she doesn't know if she's responsible, if somebody else had a plan to, you know, is this really a murder? And then things start happening to the other members of Laith House as well. And now everything is on Alex to try and figure out one, what's going on, and then two, how do I stop it? And it was just, it was such a page turner for me. It was a thriller, it's an action novel, it's got great characters. I loved Alex, I loved Darlington. Um, the other member of Laith House, because Laith House is like super small as opposed to the other groups, I don't know, I guess that's how it stays super secret, um, was their researcher. And the researcher, I can't remember the researcher's name, Dawes, is basically I was picturing her as like she's a librarian to be because Alex would come back and say, well, how do I do this with magic? And Dawes was the one that would go and look into the, you know, the tomes of magic and figure out, you know, the secret spell that she would need to do or how to do it. So I love Dawes. And then there's also a cop that's in the story who is entertaining and challenging. It, it just was really, it was a good read. Um, so if you like sort of that contemporary reality mixed with some uh, fantasy magic, two thumbs up. I will warn you, while the main mystery does have a resolution, there's going to be another book. So I'm waiting for the next book in this series. I don't know how many books there will end up being. Um, but I, I think it'll be worth it. And it kind of took me back to those, you know, yon college days as well. So those are my two back to school books. And next week we are going to be talking about books that should be made into movies. 
which I feel could be a very controversial topic <laughs> because so many books that are made into movies are very bad. So I'm going to have a hard time picking a book that I'd be okay with them trying to make it into a movie and not succeeding to my expectations. Because so, the book is always better. It is, because whatever is in my imagination, it's so rare that they can do that even through movie magic or TV magic. I've gotten to the point where now when I hear that a book I love is being turned into a movie, I immediately go, well, that's not going to no. be good. No. No. Nope. They're going to do it wrong. <laughs> They're going to ruin it. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's going to be, it's, and so now like it, for ones where um, I like the books and the movies, I almost have to separate them and say they're just two different worlds, you yes, know, absolutely. Harry Potter books, love yeah. you, but they're a whole different world from this Harry Potter movie world. Yeah, absolutely. You know, have to have that cognitive dissonance between my books and my movies. So, so that'll be a fun topic. More magical, what's more magical than when it does work out? And the movie is as wonderful as the book is. That is true. So that'll be a fun topic for next week. Thank you to all of you for participating and sharing your back to school books. Ladies, I just want to say I always enjoy doing these. Thank you, Jennifer, for organizing them. But this is the first time I've wanted to read one of the books that each of you have talked about. Usually I get, you know, one or two good ideas. Like I want one of uh, Jen's. I want one of Bandy's. I want one of Jennifer's. This has been a, a really uh, particularly enjoyable one for me. I hope other people who are watching this feel the same way. I hope so too. Thank you, Barbara. So thank you to those who listen and we hope that you have titles that you've added to your list and have great weeks and we'll see you next time. Bye.